just one more presentation before we take part in that discussion. Uh, Professor Terry Sanowski uh, from the Brain 2025 project. Good morning to you. Well, I'm pleased to be here to represent the U.S. Brain Initiative Project. I'm from the Salk Institute, and here uh, you see the, our plaza overlooking the Pacific Ocean. On April 2nd, 2013, President Obama announced a major grand challenge, the Brain Initiative. The, you, the NIH, National Institutes of Health, spend five and a half billion dollars a year on neuroscience research. The bulk of that is for translational research to try to understand brain disorders and neurological uh, uh, problems in brains and, and clinical trials, which are of course very important. The brain initiative uh, is only 10% of that total, but it's going to have a major impact because the focus, as you can see, is on innovative neurotechnology. That is to say, the goal is to bring engineers, physicists, mathematicians to work closely with neuroscientists to develop tools and techniques that will accelerate research so that we can reduce the time it takes to get to the bottom of one of these debilitating disorders such as Alzheimer's and, and autism. So instead of taking 100 years, that could be compressed down into 10 years. Now, just before the announcement was made, uh, there's a small group that got together uh, outside the East Room, and I just want to point out some of the major players. First of all, this brain initiative was actually initiated not by the uh, major uh, institu institutions, agencies like NIH and NSF, it was in started by a small foundation, the Kavli Foundation, and in particular, Byung Chun, shown here on the right, who uh, brought it to the attention of the Office of Science and Technology Policy. Now, uh, the lead agency is the National Institutes of Health, and Francis Collins is the director. The, uh, it includes uh, the NSF, Na National Science Foundation, Cora Merritt, the direct, then director, and uh, DARPA, uh, Defense Advanced Research Project Administration, uh, RRT Prabhakar is the director. But in addition to these three government agencies, there are also three private foundations uh, and institutions that were announced. And that included, uh, first of all, the uh, Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Uh, this is Jerry Rubin, the director of the Janelia Research Campus. Uh, included the Allen Institute for Brain Science, this is Alan Jones, and included the Salk Institute. That has been increased now over the last few years to three additional government agencies. Uh, IARPA, the Intelligence the Research uh, Project Administration, includes the FDA, and very soon the Department of Energy. And in addition, uh, several more foundations, including the Simons Foundation. And in fact, the last year, more research uh, support came from private foundations and the private sector than from the government. It was now running about uh, $250 million a year. So I was asked, along with uh, uh, 14 other researchers, to uh, provide the director of NIH with a, pr a plan, a 10-year plan, uh, which set priorities, milestones, uh, budgets. Uh, this is, uh, was, it was a great effort, took us over a year. Uh, several of the people who um, took part in this are actually here at this forum, including um, Mark Schnitzer, uh, David Anderson, who's speaking this afternoon, and uh, John Donahue, who's on our panel. Now, uh, Cornelia, uh, Corey Bargman and Bill Newsom were the chair, and I think that uh, they really deserve the bulk of the credit for creating a document that actually is having an impact because NIH is using this to develop RFAs for research projects, and now in the third year has been quite successful. This is a bottom-up effort. Really, it's an attempt by neuroscientists to come up with a, a real uh, uh, plan that is going to go step-by-step. Step. Uh, we had 48 outs, uh, outside experts that we consulted. We met for times, we had four workshops, and that led to Brain 2025, which was released uh, in 2014, but it really set the priorities. And amongst the different 
uh, recommendations that we made, you recognize that this overlaps a lot with the, with the China Brain Project uh, and the, China and the uh, Japanese project. Uh, it, and it, it really comes down to trying to use modern tools and techniques and scaling that up. For example, we know that in the retina, there are on the order of 60 to 80 different cell types, different shapes and sizes having different functions. How many neurons are there in the rest of the brain? We don't have a number. We don't really know. It's probably in the thousands. Uh, we would like not just to have a catalog, but we'd like to have genetic access. And by that, I mean we want to be able to go in and be able to target with drugs specific types of neurons. For example, it's thought that in schizophrenia, inhibitory interneurons may be, uh, dis have a dysfunction and if we could go in and just target those neurons with the drug, not affecting all the rest of the neurons in the brain, but just those specific types of interneurons, we might be able to alleviate some of the symptoms and perhaps even cure some of these diseases that right now we have no real effective drugs to cure. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to be telling you in a moment progress that's been made, very substantial progress in large-scale recording. Uh, but that having the physiology and being able to record from the neurons clearly is, is, is uh, necessary, but you need to be able to know the connectivity between the neurons. How did the activity come about? And that uh, is uh, advancing very rapidly too. We want to be able to uh, scale up uh, the ability using electro the, the electron microscopic techniques to be able to look at all the connections between neurons uh, on a large scale, and that's called connectomics. We also want to be able to study behaviors. Uh, neuroscientists uh, tip, typically pick out a particular type of behavior, a perceptual uh, a target, for example, what's the threshold, or a particular form of learning, such as fear conditioning. But we need much broader behavioral assays, uh, ones that, in fact, are relevant for humans uh, in terms of our own unique abilities, such as language. Uh, and finally, in my own area, uh, it's been recognized that with the deluge of data that will be coming out from the anatomical and physiological recordings and the behavior, we're going to need to bring in uh, uh, experts who are good at modeling the data. And you've heard about the Human Brain Project and the Blue Brain Project. This is a very pioneering work. But also trying to understand theoretically what are, what's the conceptual framework within which the brain uh, can be understood, the normal function of the brain, and then how does that go wrong in some of these mental disorders? And finally, uh, bringing these computational neuroscientists together with the experimentalists working very closely at the very beginning of the project so that you can design the project so that by the end you'll be assured that you can have a, uh, a data set that can give answers to questions. So let me give you uh, an example um, of how we can create large data sets and just to give you a sense for where we are. Back in 1960, David Hubel developed the tungsten microelectrode, which made it possible for the first time to record from single neurons. Before that, it was gross recordings from the scalp or from the field potentials. But now, as you can see, these are pyramidal cells in, in the cortex uh, that a single microelectrode can pick up spikes from single neurons. And from that, they were able to describe the properties of single neurons in the visual cortex. And this technique now has been used for the last 50 years to characterize the properties of neurons in many, many parts of the cortex and other parts of the brain. The problem, as you can readily imagine, is that recording from one neuron at a time, you have uh, a lot of neurons to record from. There's 100 billion in the human brain, and one at a time will take us into the next century. But it's even worse. Suppose that you had a retina with one pixel corresponding to one neuron, and you were tasked with the problem of figuring out what's in the real world by simply moving this pixel around and seeing what's in different locations one at a time. You would be hard pressed to understand anything about the visual world because you need to have the whole pattern to understand what objects are, how far away they are. And for the first time, we need to develop now these tools that will allow us to see all the activity or a large fraction of it. Now, this was a, when we first started, uh, considered to be a pie in the sky. How could you possibly get, you know, billion electrodes into the brain at the same time? It's not possible. But fortunately, over the last decade, optical techniques have become possible so that you can use genetically encoded markers of activity. And then by using uh, modern microscope, uh, optical microscopic techniques, you can assay 
literally thousands of neurons at the same time. Now this particular experiment, which was uh, done at Genelia by Misha Ahrens, is from a zebrafish larva. It has a transparent brain, which obviously is an advantage if you are trying to record from neurons in depth. Uh, and it allowed uh, them to record from 80,000 neurons, almost all of the neurons in the zebrafish brain, at roughly the same time. And I'm gonna play for you what this looks like. Now this is, I think, uh, you, what you'll see is, is, is really astonishing, something that I would have never ever imagined when I first got into neuroscience over 30 years ago. So the, 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 the light flashes that you're seeing are individual neurons, you know, the uh, yellow, orange, and you can see this is a f immobilized fish, so it's not swimming. And this is spontaneous intrinsic activity. This is what the fish is thinking. And now here you have the Chinese curse. May you get what you wish for. How do, you, how do we ever expect to figure out what's going on when we can't relate this to behavior or to any sensory input? This is intrinsic, spontaneous activity. And that's the challenge. Now, it's, this is true not just of model systems like the zebrafish or the mouse, it's also true of the human brain. Because after all, when we're sitting quietly in a dark room, spontaneous activity courses through our brain. It's called thinking. And trying to understand thinking is one of the grand challenges. And what goes wrong with thinking in schizophrenia and other mental disorders is something we want to understand. So what you see here is uh, an experiment that was done uh, in collaboration with Sid Cash at MGH. Epilepsy patients who have uh, are implanted with electrodes to isolate the focus of the seizure uh, have to have uh, uh, this implant that lasts for a week, and during that we can, re we can record from the surface of the cortex. And I just want to show you a pattern of activity that occurs while you're asleep. These are sleep spindles. Thousands occur during the night, and they're important for memory consolidation. So just follow the, 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 uh, the, the activity. The uh, high activity is white, and low activity is black. This is a 10 hertz spindle. And as you can see, the activity spreads from one part of the cortex to the other in a circular fashion. Once every 100 milliseconds, it circulates through the entire cortical mantle. A little bit like this. We call this Princess Leia waves. Now, this is first discovered in humans because it, it really is the first time we could look at the global pattern of activity, but clearly this is telling us something very important about memory consolidation. So I'm going to finish quickly by saying that uh, I've just focused on the NIH, but uh, there are other government agencies. DARPA, for example, is developing new techniques for deep brain stimulation that will vastly improve the current technology, uh, memory prosthesis, recovering active memory. Uh, and finally, uh, one of the most important tools that we have is machine learning. And you've probably heard about deep learning. Well, last year in Montreal at the NIPS meeting, Neural Information Processing Systems, 3,800 researchers, primarily from math and physics and engineering, but also cognitive science and neurobiology showed up to understand these very large high dimensional data sets that are being collected because without these new tools and techniques, uh, it's gonna be hopeless. And I, I really think that with a concerted effort between all the different uh, disciplines in science and across all the different brain uh, projects and all the different countries, we will make progress so that in 10 years, we'll have a much better idea of, of the function of different parts of the human brain. So finally, let me just uh, give you a little uh, anecdote about that moment before the initiative. Uh, President Obama wanted to thank us. And I, just before this moment, I had been talking to the director of DARPA here, just off to the right, when somebody tapped me on the shoulder. And I was completely unprepared. I turned around and there's President Obama towering over me. And I hadn't even prepared, didn't even tell him you know, what my name was. All I did was to say, thank you, Mr. President, <laughs> and thank you. <laughs> very, very nice.